Hi, hello, and welcome to the practice based learning webinar series. So, this is our final webinar, a series of five. Get the slides to move. Okay, so my name is Kalima Ibrahim. I'm chair, RCOT chair uh, for the England board and also a lecturer at the University of East London. And so we're RCOT, so we champion occupational therapy. We're here to achieve life-changing breakthroughs for our members and the people that they support and for society as a whole. So we promote and value occupation and improving people's health and well-being. So we promote the value of occupational therapy as a means of improving people's health. And we have a vision that people everywhere value the life-changing power of occupational therapy. So our profession is growing, so we have over 45 education providers across the UK, delivering over 100 programmes with over 7,000 learners, over 700 new graduates, and increasingly diverse cohorts experiencing a range of practice-based learning opportunities across the four pillars of practice. So we need to think differently about how, how our placement opportunities meet the needs of our learners, our services, and the people that we serve. So on the 20th of October 2022, um, RCOT, um, in collaboration with the CSP, developed a series of guiding principles, so the principles of practice-based learning, so working together to develop our future workforce. So there's seven guiding principles, and there should be a link in the chat, and also at the end you can also download those from the RCOT website as well. Okay, so this webinar is called Demystifying Practice-Based Learning, so it's a panel discussion and a Q&A. So we'll have a discussion and if you just like throughout the chat, you could just put your questions in the chat or in there, so in the question box, the Q&A box, and we can get to your questions. Okay, so this is a session plan, as I said before, we're going to obviously have a discussion and then there'll be a Q&A. So these are the principles of practice based learning, so this discussion should cover basically one to seven for our practice based learning principles as well. And also you can download those, the link should be in the chat and also the develop learning and development standards for pre -reg registration education as well. Okay, so if you have any questions and comments, you can put them in the Q&A box and also in the chat and just share your thoughts. And if you want to talk on social media, it's hashtag RCOT PBL. And these are our Twitter handles as well, if you want to tweet us. Okay, so on the panel today, we have Elizabeth Julian. She's a Therapies Practice Placement Manager at University Hospitals Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. And Terry Grant, a Principal Lecturer at University of Worcester. And Rosina Kazur and Derek Taylor Amir. They're both students, final year or well, third year students from Coventry University. And also Carolyn Hay, RCOT Head of Education. So today we'll have the discussion. So throughout our discussion, you can ask questions and we can answer your questions live as well. Okay, so you can unmute your cameras. Hello, do you just want to do a quick round of introductions? So I'll just go to my screen, so Terry's first. Hi, I'm Terry. Um, I'm an occupational a principal lecturer, sorry, in occupational therapy. Um, I um, was previously the practice education lead for occupational therapy here at University of Worcester, and I've been involved in lots of um, new and different kind of placement experiences, both as a, an organiser, if you like, for the university and as a practice educator myself. Okay, and Derek. Hello, um, I'm Derek. Um, as mentioned before, I'm a third year occupational therapist student. And now I have completed three placements in various different areas, which include which include physical, mental health, and educational settings. Okay, and Rosina. Um, so like Derek, I'm a third year occupational therapy student. Um, and similarly, I've had um a physical and mental health um placement um and also a role emerging placement at the University of Worcester. Okay, and Elizabeth. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Julian and I'm an occupational therapist and I'm also practice placement manager for therapies, as, as you said, Kalima. Um, and yeah, I, I think I'm here because I, I, I love students. I love I love practice placements, um, which is a good thing in this role. And uh, a little bit like Terry have now been involved in lots of different um, models, really, um, and, and different ways of providing placements. OK, and Carolyn. 
Hi, I'm Carolyn. Um, I'm uh, Head of Education at RCOT. I've worked at RCOT for a couple of years now. Um, and prior to that, worked in education um, on um, supporting the development of pre-reg programmes. So I love um, student education. I love hoping, uh, yeah, kind of supporting people to get the best introduction to this fabulous profession that they can. So that's kind of where, where I'm coming from today. So the panel today are very enthusiastic about student placements as well, and just looking at how we can increase capacity in placements as well with our increasing workforce, and also giving students a good experience in placements and developing our clinical staff as well as education, and how we can all work together to provide you know, very good you know, practice placements. So um, the first question I'll go through is, um, so this, some, just the, this, sorry, this panel is, a, just the, sorry, this webinar is about just some questions that we've received where people have asked throughout the webinars as well, and just questions. So we're just going to go through some of those questions and just see if we can uh, address any of those. And also throughout the webinar, just co put some of your comments in the chat and also in the Q&A box, you can put your questions and we can get to those. So one of the questions is, I'm being asked to take more than one student at a time. So like, why is that so I'll go to um, Terry first yeah absolutely so um, the first thing I want to say is taking more than one student at a time is easier than taking just one student and it's one of those kind of myths that I think everybody thinks and feels and I put myself absolutely in that box until I did it that you assume that taking two students or more than two students is going to be twice the amount of work and twice the amount of effort um, and that it's going to be problematic um, so there are lots of reasons that we might be asking people to take more than one student at once, but partly it's actually that it will make it easier for you. So when you have two students on placement together, they can work together on some projects, they can work together um, to develop maybe their plans for what they're going to do with clients or in other settings, um, and they have each other to bounce off, so they can ask each other those kind of tricky questions, and it help, really helps them to kind of get their confidence in asking each other those tricky questions before they then come to you as an educator. And of course, as an educator, the benefit is that they are doing that work and you are not necessarily directly involved in it so it's not more work for you to do um, you are enabling the students to you know to benefit from that learning environment without actually needing to do kind of double the work of course there are two assessments to do if you've got two students or three or four or whatever so you can't get away from that um, and students obviously need to have appropriate supervision and I think there are times when it feels like it's maybe a little bit more of a time load but there are lots of sort of ways that you can manage that um, peer supervision for parts of the of the sessions is one way around it you know using your whole team there are so many ways you can do it um, and I have to say I hand on heart I would not go back to having a student on their own to having just one student I can't conceive what that would look like for me anymore um, because the yeah having two students or more than two students is just so much easier um, and so much more beneficial for everybody involved. And I just come to Rosina and Derek. So I go to Rosina first. So both of you were together on placement as well. So how was that for you? And what do you feel the benefits? So we just go to Rosina first. Um, it definitely helped me. Like Terry said, um, if there was anything I wasn't um, a, a a sure of, I could go and ask Derek. Um, and it definitely felt like I um, was then more autonomous in my learning because I didn't keep going back to Terry or my educator to um, ask them really simple questions. I could go to Derek first and then we could both collaborate and um, mind map some ideas about a group project or simple questions like, oh, should we go and do this today? Um, so it definitely helped having some uh, another student there to kind of bounce ideas off each other um, rather than keep going back to the educator um, to ask them questions. Um, and it was kind of nice to have that um, peer support. Um, so it, it's always nice to have um, supervision from um, like a, your clinical lead or manager or someone more senior than yourself. Um, but it's nice to have the peer support from somebody who is on the same level as you um, and they're able to support you knowing what you know and what they know and um, rather than having a more senior. Um, so, yeah, it was really nice. Okay. And Derek, or how is that for you? Um, yeah, I have to agree with everything that Rosina said. It does feel nice to have someone else that's on the same boat essentially because at times it can be daunting going into a new area and if you're on your own it just feels like oh I'm being just <laughs> trucked into this but having the other person I'm like okay I can work with this person we can bounce ideas of each other we can go through things before actually doing it and not only does it 
helps you calm down a bit and makes you like a little bit more secure, but it does give you that confidence. As Terry was saying, it gives you, it boosts your entire, <laughs> um, your entire, um, however you're feeling essentially. And it's a good as well. I think not only does it help you, but it's a good challenge. It's a good push when you're working with someone because at times if you're on your own, I well, this is more of a personal experience, but when I'm on my own, I find it a little difficult to go above and beyond what I think I can do. I think I would just get to one point and sit there. But when I'm working with someone, I'm like, okay, I can do this. But after speaking with this person, I know I can do this more. And if I work with this person, I know we can do more and so on and so on and so on. So it's a great, it's a great opportunity to like bounce ideas, but also develop those um, team working skills. And um, yeah, all the different skills that not only are you applying in placement, but also with this other person that you can also bring into your placement. So overall, yeah, I think I think it's a really good opportunity. It's a really great experience to have another student with you throughout placement. Yeah, it is, yeah, of course. Um, Liz? I mean, what what can I add to that? I mean, you've just advertised that beautifully um, from a lived experience. I mean, I think that, you know, the only thing I would add is is just like Terry said, I think until you do it, it it's a little bit of a hard one to believe. <laughs> <laughs> you know that it actually it's really going to be easier you know th th this is propaganda but actually it's not true um and I think that just the actual question was what why am I being asked and I think there are a few real answers to that so one one of them is exactly as Terry said that actually it, it's a better experience um usually now that's not to say there are never any challenges but that's no different for whether you have one or eight students you know that that could, there can be challenges in all of those scenarios um and there's also the fact that we do need to open up our capacity and so um taking more than one student obviously does mean more students have more practice placements and that's what we need don't we because the the, the workforce to come they need their placements just the same as we had them so um you know there, that is part of it as well so i i, I think that that's a you know just to give a bit of a bit of balance to, to that um but i've definitely got colleagues who I've worked with who were a little bit skeptical, you know, raised an eyebrow at me about having more than one who were absolutely um, changed in their viewpoint now, now that they've tried it, they're completely changed. Um, and it's great when I can get our educators together and they can talk to each other. And it's not just me saying it, you know, they can say just like uh, Derek and Rosina have. Um, and the one last thing I'll just add is I loved Rosina that you used the word collaborate in there because I think what some people express to me is they worry about students competing with each other um I'm not saying that's never happened but I think that there's something there about how it's introduced and the expectations and you know that idea that actually this is about collaboration this isn't about competition um I'm not saying healthy rivalry uh, you know can't come into it sometimes but I think you know it's much more about collaborating just like it would be in a real workplace um in a real team you know that you are in a real scenario here just like you will be when you're qualified so I think as as students working together that's what it's what we want isn't it for the benefit of the patient mm -hmm. yeah and uh, Carolyn there's, there's not a huge amount to add is there you know we've got people absolutely selling this for us I think you know um, as as Rosina said but also Derek you know you, you said there that it gives you the opportunity to rise up a little bit more between the two of you because you're bouncing off each other's ideas and together in some ways you're you're stronger and, and kind of can take things off in a different direction which is, is really valuable I think that kind of two things I would add one is you know there is scope for that we're talking here about taking more than one occupational therapy student at a time which I'd absolutely advocate but there's also ways of doing that across other professions um, and you know where you're working within a team recognizing that you're a multi-professional team then there might be opportunities there um, and the other bit is um, Anita Volker who who spoke at one of our sessions recently and Katrina Bannigan had a editorial in um, the British Journal of OT a couple of months ago I want to say July but I might be wrong um, talking about exactly this and why it's so important um, and how you know there's a real push for us to move forwards and I think you guys have done a really good sales pitch of bringing what they've talked about um, and some of the, the theory and principles behind that into actually what this looks like in practice so have a look at that or the Glasgow Caledonian University blog also talks a bit about it as well. Yeah. Just to add as well, I had a, um, a non-traditional role emerging placement as well and my educator took four students 
So um, it was all new. I mean, we were the only ones, I think, in the cohort at the time when we just had four of us are going to the same place. And again, what Rosina said, it was that collaboration. We worked together. We didn't have to go to the educator too much. We can bounce ideas off of each other. And we set up a, a business case as well for a service, which I got funding afterwards. And a few years later, I went back to work in that service. So it was actually really a really good experience. So I, I do advocate for having more than one student as well. And I think it's a good learning opportunity for all involved as well. And using the team as well, the MDT, to also provide that support and, you know, across obviously all different disciplines and also your support staff as well. Obviously, everyone's got some, you know, something to add and, and something that students will benefit from as well. So I think that's uh, good. So I think uh, hopefully we've sold it. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> you can send us messages and see, you know, if, if you've tried it out and let us know. OK, and also, um, can you see the benefits to using these approaches as well, um, involving like newly qualified staff as well, in terms of um, providing uh, students placements as well, support or whether or not supervision or whether or not being involved in in providing the support? Um, we go to Carolyn. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got our, I'm not going to be doing my job properly if I don't talk about our placement principles and keep referring to that through this conversation. So, you know, one of those placement principles talks about um, everybody being involved. They take a place across all the principles. And it's a whole team approach. Um, and for me, I think it's about really defining what your role is in practice based learning within your team at every point through your career. So there is absolutely a role for support workers. There's absolutely a role for people who aren't occupational therapists working within your team. Um, and as soon as we've come into practice, there is a role there for thinking about what how you can support learners. You're, you've just been through this process yourself. So you absolutely have got that experience. Um, and that compassion and that empathy for, for what people are going through. Um, you know what worked really well for you as an individual, how you saw educators work. So absolutely, I think it, for me, it needs to be built into part of our roles. And if it's there from day one, then that's absolutely something we are doing. And, you know, we talk about in the um, Code of Ethics, professional conduct around creating a culture of learning. So that responsibility sits with you as soon as you're um, involved in occupational therapy practice. Um, so yeah there's always a way to do it and if you're finding that it's difficult kind of you know maybe at different points in your career to support learners in terms of being that named person who who is responsible or giving regular time for supervision then there's plenty of other ways to get involved in terms of delivering different sessions or mentoring new educators so that they can you know they'll have had their education at university and and had the place practice educator training but you know, then you're doing it on the job and to have that support there and, and share your expertise and be on hand is really valuable as well. So there is absolutely a role for everyone at every point in your career uh, to support to support students and also to find a way that works to your strengths as well. Um, and maybe the things that you're wanting to develop on for your own personal development and use this as a CPD opportunity for you. Okay, and Liz, do you have anything to add? I think I think only that, you know, I, I think when you're newly qualified, I, I imagine, I know that when I was newly qualified, I felt like I knew very little <laughs> and, and then really started to learn, <laughs> you know, even more when I kind of was, was in my, my first post. So I, I think for, for me personally, you know, the first few months might not have been the right time for me, but actually on my second rotation, which was then six months in, my supervisor had a student and I wasn't the, the named educator and, and, and rightly so, but the student did spend time with me and I think that helped her and me. So it gave her, I think, a, a peer, a little bit like we've just been talking about with two students together. No, I was no longer a student, but I wasn't that far ahead of her, <laughs> if, that, if, if you know what I mean. Um, and and it, it was about sort of being honest in the sense of I wasn't trying to pretend I knew everything. It was absolutely saying I'm on my second rotation. This is all quite new to me as well. This is what I do. You know, what do you think? And, and what have you been, what, you know, and, and actually it was, I think it was as helpful for me as I hope it was for the, the student um, who went on to be a wonderful occupational therapist and, and a friend actually. So, um, and she's never told me I was a terrible uh, <laughs> influence. So, um, but I think, I think, yeah, there's, there's obviously there's a reality. I just, I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm thinking that I want people to know that of course, there will be circumstances where if there are particular challenges, you know, it might be that we would consider our whole team and think, OK, you know, we're not going to 
kind of ask certain things of certain people at certain times. But I think we should be open to the idea that actually it's perfectly reasonable and in fact more than that it's actually really beneficial for all parties concerned for our students to spend time with more newly qualified um uh practitioners i i really i really do believe that and and it is about then how we as um i say that that's the royal we it's about we as teams it's, and team leaders and services how we prepare our team for that whether that's through their own perceptorship through their own supervision through our own team meetings and and so on mm -hmm. okay and um terry anything to add yeah just to say that you know, i've had some experience as a placement tutor of some of our new graduates then going on to become our practice educators really very quickly after they've graduated and the feedback from students is unfailingly good. So students really appreciate having that near peer experience that, that Liz was just describing. Um, and um, it's really lovely for, for graduates to go out knowing that they've got something to offer. And I think there's something about that, putting yourself in a space where you realise that you do know things, actually, after all, even though you might be in a space where you feel like, oh, gosh, now I'm qualified and I'm supposed to know stuff and I don't feel like I do. There's something about the experience of supervising a student student that helps you to go oh I do know actually it, it's okay um so feedback that we've had has you know has been you know without exception it's always been fantastic but because I think that the graduates that put themselves forwards and that push to be able to take the students are the graduates who are ready um and there are some people of course you know who aren't but I think we need to you know we should be listening to our newly qualified staff and if that's something that they feel that they um, are wanting to do and are, are feeling ready to do then yes of course scaffold them and give them you know some additional support or maybe some additional time compared to other educators but letting them get stuck in straight away I think you know it can can only be beneficial um, not just for them and their development but for the students that are coming behind them as well and what great role models for students to then go oh actually my educator on my placement who was really fantastic they'd only just qualified and maybe I can do that and in terms of thinking about opening up capacity um, yeah I think that there's quite a, a range of people who maybe do feel ready who perhaps aren't in structures that that are quite so supportive as they could be um, and, and they you know the more capacity we have the easier it is on everybody um, because you know, the same people are not being pushed so I think there are yeah, there are lots of really good reasons for encouraging newly qualified therapists to to explore um, practice education but you know of course with a few caveats but our experience has been nothing but good so it's about recognizing as well the support systems in place within the team and what's available to the the newly qualified um, practitioner as well i don't know uh, derek and, and rosina did you have any experience working with um newly qualified staff on your placement I'll go to Derek first. Um, and then your yeah. Placement. yeah, I think in my first placement is when I had it a lot more. But um, to be more specific about OT, I, when I first joined, I think two days after, we're probably the same day, there was a new OT assistant who joined and she had a background in, um, in physiotherapy and now she's moving to OT assistant to just get that experience. And I think similar to working with Rosina, we're having that... Um, other student as Liz was saying it does give you that peer support because I just felt because obviously it's my first placement it's a new environment I don't I'm not sure if I know what I'm doing I'm not sure if I'm what to expect but her being there I was like I don't know what I'm doing and she was like I'm not too sure either what <laughs> what can we do so we just like spoke about it we spoke about obviously different issues she's an OT assistant I'm a student but it did give that room of okay She's an OT assistant. She's worked in a different area before. She's able to help me with the concerns that I have. And it give, gave me that boost. I'm like, okay, I feel a little bit better now. But also, if, a, if another student was to come in next week, I would also be able to support them. So as Terry was saying, it gives you that room of, it makes you feel like you know. <laughs> it makes you feel like you're learning off them. And from that learning, I could help someone who might be in, the, in a similar situation. And I guess as well in my second year placement, this one wasn't very specific to OT, but I did we did have different professionals coming in. So there was a psychology assistant, there was um, a social worker, and I think it was a similar similar um, situation. Obviously not the same because not the same profession, but it did give you that they're fairly new, I'm fairly new. 
I see they're doing great. They're going through it. That means I can as well. <laughs> so I don't see why I couldn't be able to go and do as great as they're doing. So yeah, I, yeah. Overall, I think it just gives you that confidence boost, but also someone to work with, someone to learn from, someone that you can relate to a lot easier. Um, not saying I can't relate at all to <laughs> my educator, obviously, but it just gives you that room of, okay, this person is doing this great. I really like how they're doing it. What can I learn from them? So not only are you learning from your placement, not only are you learning from your educator, from experience, but it also gives you that other room to go in and learn from. So yeah, yeah, overall, yeah, I think it's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah, that goes back to the placement principles as well, using the team, the whole team approach as well to provide yeah. practice-based learning. So, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Rosina, any experiences for you? Um, yeah, I, in my second placement in trauma and orthopedics, there was um, another OT who was on a rotation there. <clears throat> and um, so he was a band five. Um, and it was really helpful to be with him because if I was like too scared to ask my educator a question, I could always go to him first. Um, and it was much more, it was much less daunting than going to my educator, who was a band six. Um, <clears throat> and it was really nice to go to him first as like the first point of call. Um, and he also, he studied at Coventry as well. So he was always giving me little tips and tricks on how I could pass my assignments or um, <laughs> The presentations that we had to do at the end of our placements um so it was really nice to have that um assignment support as well from him um but yeah it was all he was kind of like the middleman if you can call it that um between myself and my educator um and I'd do a lot of um collaborative um work with him going to see patients and um it was less so with my educator I did more a lot more work with him and it was nice to see when um he asked my educator or other um senior members of staff questions it was nice to know oh okay so he doesn't know that it means I won't necessarily need to know that um at this stage um of my um student career or at the stage of my um when I'm qualified I may not know something and that's okay yeah yeah, yeah. And it's good as good demonstrations well to ask questions and we don't know everything and we have to we learn as we go along as well so yeah, that's a good example so we have another question it says i'm in a highly specialist role in a very specialist placement area can i only take final year learners uh, i'll go to carolyn first <laughs> i think i say this statement every session that i ever chat to are uh, Learners, yes, you can. Yeah, absolutely, you can. Our our learners are there to meet the learning outcomes of their placement, um, not not to do our full jobs. And you know, it's taken years of experience and hard work and graft to get to the point that everybody's at it in their careers. So, this is about saying what elements of your role can we share with a learner that could be picked up on? So could it be an aspect of the OT process or is there something that you've got repetition on? Um, you know, what are the bits that they don't need to get involved in? Um, and to really just take that approach in it. But I think if we can move away from thinking that people are coming on placement to do your job in its entirety, but they're coming to meet specific learning outcomes um, and each student will bring in their own strengths and their own previous experience and particular things that they're wanting to focus on within that placement as well you can absolutely make it work so for me it's about having a really clear conversation with the university about you know understanding your job role but also talking about what's the expectations of each placement um, and thinking then about how could you structure that placement to give the opportunities relevant to that learning that level of learning for that student um, yeah, so I think that that's the bits from, from my point of view, really. Some of the questions you also have as well, where people are asking, could they only take MSc students, but they're, they're both pre-reg, isn't it? The undergrad and the postgrad, they're still pre-reg students. So it will be the same placement and the same learning outcomes that they need to meet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, to, um, yeah Karen, sorry, Karen. I was going to say, for people who are undertaking, people just, oh, I'm sorry again, Karen, sorry, I've got a brain full of cold. Um, they, um, people who are undertaking an MSc, so a BSc, an MSc, a postgraduate certificate, and we, we've now got doctoral level students as well coming in, but um, their placements are all assessed at the same level um, and needing to meet the same standards, you, do, you know, that that's all exactly the same. Um, but everyone, you know, regardless of what route they're studying is coming in with different levels of experience. So somebody coming in to do an MSc will have previous research experience behind them 
um, but they might not have some other experience that somebody coming in to do a BSc will have done. So it's really about understanding and having that conversation right at the beginning. We're just about to take some students from Worcester, which is really exciting. And I've got a form from them to tell everything, you know, everything that we need to know about the placement. And I've got a load of questions that I want to ask our students who are coming in terms of understanding their background and their experience. So it's really about getting, you know, using that time, using the pre-placement visits, the opportunities you've got beforehand and in that induction week to really understand the students as individuals and be clear on what the learning outcomes are for that placement. Okay, so um, we'll go to Liz next. I think I think just, no, I completely agree with everything Carolyn says. I, I think it's something we come across quite a lot. <laughs> and I, and I, sorry, I'm sort of laughing ruefully because it is, <laughs> I just, it really annoys me <laughs> that, that we sort of have this idea um, and it's because exactly what you said, Carolyn, it's because we make the mistake of thinking, how can a student come in and do this very specialist role? That And, and so I understand why I totally do. Um, but but that absolutely is not what they're there to come in and do. It, it, it's not that's not fair. So there's all kinds of things that you can give them exposure to um, that will absolutely help their understanding of the context and all of those things. Um, you know, I used to work in what I thought was a very specialist role and I would have students of, of any year um, and, it, and I would have to tailor the placement to the student, um, regardless actually of what level they were in. It was up to the individual student, but um, we need to think about what we do for our patients. We're very good at grading things and tailoring things to our patients. And a student said to me um, last year, um, we need surely it's useful to think in a student centered way. And I was like, why don't we say that more often? What an amazing you know, phrase. Um, and, and to me, it fits perfectly with, with this idea. So student centered people. You heard it <laughs> in the first. <laughs> and Terry? Yeah, and I would just, uh, you know, I, I sympathise, and I think we, we've, you know, lots of us have been there in those kind of specialist roles, and I think to some extent we're, you know, we're so proud of getting ourselves to those specialist roles that we then kind of create some little ivory tower around ourselves that that doesn't need to be there. So I think to some extent we we need to maybe all take a step back and have a look at actually what's our what's our actual reasoning for saying this level of student or that level of student is appropriate or they you know or they con you know conversely or they must only be a first year I couldn't take a third you know third year I've heard that as well um I think we need to just kind of have a word with ourselves really and, and you know try and work out what's the actual reasoning behind that because um again I'm sorry to sort of labor the point but as Carolyn said students are not on placement to show you what they know already and do the job they're on placement to learn and as long as there are things that are going on in your practice that the students can be part of which there always are then they can learn um, and you can you can tailor what they're doing you know around their own particular need, um, learning needs I mean to be fair you know uh, um, the placement that, that I offer in education um, I do offer to third year students for the reason that there are some ethical issues around them working with um, very near peers that I haven't yet ironed out. That doesn't mean to say that we'll never offer it, um, you know, further down the uh, um, you know, down the, the years. Um, but the same thoughts were there around, do I offer a placement at all? And I think there are probably some educators in specialist areas that are not taking students because the areas are, are specialist. Um, and, you know, that was where we started. Well, actually, you know, we're not role modeling this very well. It, yes, it's very specialist to be an educator as an occupational therapist, but it's no more specialist than, you know, than, than being a band seven or you know, a band six in, in other areas that I couldn't begin to do. So it's about trying to understand and extrapolate the kind of core skills, which is what our students are really learning when they come on placement at the right level for them and, and not about doing the full shebang. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, right? So there's um another place another question. It says why are placements different? Why are placements different lengths for different programs? So different lengths of time across each university, I suppose. I think probably talking about the number of weeks. I will go to Carolyn first. Oh yeah, okay, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um well, so each program is as it's written um is. Uh, it's done in conjunction with talking to employers, with practice educators, recent graduates, current students on the programme, if it's a well-established one, um, and, and talking to all those key stakeholders and understanding what's need. So uh, the university I used to work at, I think I went through three accreditation events and every time we'd kind of have a blank piece of paper, go where could placements fall? And every time they fell pretty much, I mean, sometimes we would 
move them a week or extend by a week or close by a week, but they pretty much fell exactly where they were. And that model worked really well for us. And that allowed us to have, um, you know, the relationships with our educators who found that, that they, they quite liked the length of our placements. But you know, and, and Terry's got a good example here where they've had part time placements that were still, you know, there's different ways of doing it. And again, that's done in conjunction with understanding the students that are going to be coming to you and the, the educators that you're working with and how they're going to support those placements. And I think as a student, one of the things when I was chatting to people who were looking to come and, and join university programs and looking, you know, doing the trail around all the universities or virtually now to understand what course they wanted to have a think about those placements. You know, are you somebody that can do quite short placements, settles in very quickly? Or are you somebody who would actually rather have a couple of longer placements? And generally there's between three and six placements across each university. And they're not usually shorter than four or five weeks. Um, they don't normally go beyond around 12, but there's always different models within that. Um, but, you know, to understand in the same ways that we'd want people to understand the type of assessments that are taking place or how the teaching is delivered, how people are expected to engage in that. And it's about understanding how you are as a person, how it would, would benefit with you. But the decision ultimately is taken by the university, having listened to all their key stakeholders. And I, I love that you've got that variation. So they're ultimately all the university programmes are meeting our learning and development standards. They're meeting the health, um, HCPC's um, standards of education and training, but they are doing that in slightly different ways, in the same way that when you come on placement, you are meeting your learning outcomes in the slightly different opportunities that each placement offers. Yeah, and Terry? Sorry, just struggling to find that out. Um, I think the other thing to, to be aware of is that, you know, when universities are developing their programmes, they are looking at what's going on locally as well, and they're mindful of the, the local workforce. So um, trying not to put your placements exactly in the same slot as your nearest um, other HEI that offers the, the occupational therapy course is, is a starting point. And I think most universities, when they set up new courses, try really hard to work into the gaps. But there are limitations to that, and that will also kind of impact um, you know, the lengths of placement. And I think, um, you know, as Karen said, there's a, there's a great variety and it's variable and means that students can choose what they prefer. But there will also be a slightly different um, emphasis or steer from a particular teaching team that you know, as to what they value. So, so it might be that there's a particular teaching team that, that really wants students to kind of get embedded and, and be in there for a long time and, and have, you know, particular reasons for wanting longer placements there are other um, institutions where they'll say actually you know we want variety we're gonna we're gonna put our, our stall there instead and we're gonna go for the variety over the the length um, and there, there are pros and cons to both and there isn't one answer that, that fits everybody and so students rightly should be looking at what suits them and then joining the course that suits them best so by having that variety we can actually meet more learner needs than if we all had a very fixed um, length of, of time for a placement. So um, from a practice point of view for Elizabeth, so you obviously take students from different universities, the different lengths of time. Do you see any benefits from longer placements or shorter placements or any feedback you've had from students? Or I, I, I have to say, I can't comment too strongly on this because where we're based in the country, we have one main provider and um, and we have we have a, a seven week and two 10 weeks um, nowadays. Um, there are other universities that we take from um, a little bit, and I don't think it differs that greatly, if I'm honest. So I can't say that I can see a, a great difference. What I can say, just as a as a an, an educator in practice, um, I think in the past, I think there have been times when I've thought, okay, that's only a five week placement when things were different. That's only a five week placement. Um, actually, I, I I can commit to that over the the 12 week at the other you know for whatever reason you know depending on what's going on in the the service and and things but I think that's the only thing that it would make me think about really um otherwise it, th there is something to be said for the long placements in that students can they just have more opportunity I think to be part of the team to really consolidate their learning um uh, in my humble opinion um so that there are pros and cons i don't think there's one one way to do it at all and also once they can meet the learning outcomes even if it's a shorter placement then i suppose um and also thinking about staffing as well like you said as well so yeah 12 weeks might be quite long but 
depends on the student again so yes so feedback is, is the pros and cons like Terry and um, Carolyn have said as well um, just uh, go to Rosina and, and Derek so there's a question I'm going on my first placement what can I do to prepare so that will be for Rosina first um so you can obviously speak to your educator about the type of placement it is um, and what is going to be expected of you. Um, and for my placements, I went away once I found out what type of placement it was and researched. Um, for example, my second placement in trauma and orthopedics, I had to go away and research um, some of the anatomy that I'd be seeing on the placement. Um, um, for my first placement, I had to go away and research about learning disabilities. Um, and how an OT can work within that kind of setting. Um, so doing some research beforehand to get to know the placement type and what you will be doing in that role um, is, I think, the most important thing to be doing. Um, if you have any worries, speak to the st um, either university staff or um, the staff at the um, placement that you're going to be going to, um, just to kind of um, iron things out, um, set your worries straight and that ensures that the educator at your placement knows what kind of where your strengths and weaknesses are um, and what they can do to kind of cater for you. Um, uh, yeah, I think the main things I did was research and communicating well with the um, with the team um, to know what I had to do and what they had to do to kind of settle me in for at least the first few weeks. And uh, Derek, anything to add? Um, yeah, I fully agree with what Rosina said. Researching and making sure you're clear on <clears throat> what you will be doing is very important. I think for myself, that what I found and what I've heard of my other students, well, not my students, but other students in my course, is that um, what for, especially for first year placement, one of the things that may be like a huge concern is that for a lot of students, it's their first experience with OT, could be first experience in, in the health department in general. So I think what's daunting is that you don't know <laughs> so and obviously the, obviously the students not expected to know ex exactly what they're going to do and how is everything's going to go but it's just that oh I don't know what I'm doing I don't know what, what's going to be expected of me I don't know what what this is so managing expectations I think is very important so when you whenever you get the email saying oh here you go con congratulations you got your placement this is your educator just take some time to email the educator or talk to them which I find it better personally but just have a conversation be like I don't know <laughs> and I think something um that has been really like put into my head in my last placement something that Terry said a lot is that um it's okay to be nervous it's okay to not know because everyone's still learning everyone was at one point in their life and where they're like I don't know what I'm doing and it's I think acknowledging that and accepting that is like the first step to be able to go into your placement and do <laughs> great essentially is be okay I don't know what can I do now before I actually start my placement to know as much as I can sit down talk to your educator say I don't know I feel nervous I don't know what's expected of me I don't know if I can do this and I think accepting that and understanding that that's okay no one's going to expect a first year student to be acting like a band six <laughs> occupational therapist knows going to expect a first year student to come in and take over the job and do so it's okay <laughs> to not know it's okay to feel nervous it's okay to be like i don't know if <laughs> i can do this because that's okay because it's a new experience it's a new area for a lot of students it's their first time even learning about ot so yeah i think talking to your educator getting all your doubts all your worries out is a huge step into being able to at least calm yourself down a little bit because it's not expected for them to be like, okay, I know everything, I'm gonna go in, do the job and that's it. Because you're going to learn at the end of the day, you will be learning, it will be a new experience. And overall, yeah, I think, um, yeah, talking, communication, it's a huge thing. So making those that pre -place, placement contact obviously used to be pre placement visits, but now I suppose it'll be a meet, maybe a meeting on Teams or some emails. So making contact with your educator or your team and just find out what it might you might be doing, any kind of research as you both said, and just ensure that you yeah, kind of calm any nerves because it's all a new experience as well. So uh, Terry, do you have any anything to add? Yeah, I want to add some practical things. So wash your uniform. 
iron your uniform if you have to wear a uniform or if you're not in uniform work out what you're going to wear for your first day so get the kind of practicals down because those are things that can take up space in your head when they don't need to or they're things that you'll find at the 11th hour oh my goodness I don't know what to do about it so you know get your uniform sorted work out the journey I would really encourage if the, if you can't do a pre-placement visit because you know people have sort of tended to go across to teams meetings and those things then still do the journey at the time of day that you would be making it anyway so that you understand that okay there might be a bus at this time but it doesn't generally turn up at that time and I perhaps need to get the earlier one um or I thought it was you know Google Maps said it was a 25 minute drive and actually it's a 45 minute drive and then I've got to park and that's going to take me 20 minutes because all of those things on day one can be so stressful um and and get then you find yourself you get yourself into a well I get myself into a bit of a state when I'm stressed and then everything goes out the window and then I don't remember all the things that I'm being told anyway and it just kind of can build into something bigger than it needs to be um so you're doing the kind of practical preparation uniform lunch where are you going have lunch have you written your name in your assessment document you know all those things that can make you go okay I've done everything I can do now I can just kind of concentrate on the you know the experience itself mm, yes yeah, so there's some good tips there as <laughs> well so um, Elizabeth anything that you would give students that you any feedback or any so any tips preparing for their placement I would I would add to the 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 practical um elements and the and the um kind of reading and communication elements which are all excellent I would only add um two things really one be really familiar with your assessment document um and don't be afraid of it <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, especially if it's first placement it's a little bit like what what does this even mean and the more you read it um, the more those words will start to make sense, the more you will be able to discuss those with your supervisor on placement or with your peers. That's a key one. Um, you know, talk to your peers and go, what does this mean? What, how can we show this, you know? Um, and I think the other thing is about reflection. So I know as OTs, it's something um, that generally speaking, we will have looked at prior to placement, I would hope um, at universities, even prior to the first one. But it's something that is so key to your development and learning on placement that even if you're in an extremely specialist area as a first year and you're looking at your supervisor and thinking, I'll never be able to do what they're doing. Um, actually, that's something you can really reflect on and start to think, OK, what? things do I need to do in order to begin to that journey you know what things do I need to understand in order to build on that to be able to start to apply some of these skills so you know really sort of having your reflective heads on uh, be familiar with some models and um in terms of reflection I mean um, and, and I suppose the good old Bloom's taxonomy is always a good one to read. I always tell students about it. I'm sure everyone's sick of me going on about it. But as a, as a model of understanding learning, um, I, I think it's excellent. So please look that up before you go. Anything to add, Carolyn? I think probably there's um, two things to add. One is as a student, you can leave a bit of a legacy for the next student. So all the things we've just talked about, actually, this is, you know, um, where often um, placements will send out a, a kind of welcome pack or all sorts of different things that they'll call it. You can add to that. You can do a bit of a, you know, a bit of a letter or checklist just to hand over. These were things that I found really helpful. This is the locker code that I kept forgetting or, you know, wh whatever the practical things are. And, and as Terry says, getting those practical things, the things you can control, absolutely sorted and being ready for really helps you i think the other thing is that you are I, I, having had lots of time at universities the students would go on placement and it was almost as if we they felt like we'd gone bye have a nice time see you in 10 weeks and we haven't done that we're absolutely still there we're absolutely still individuals your personal tutors the people you've been chatting to um, and support and we are a point of contact and i would really encourage people to be continuing to have those conversations with the university proactively um, you'll have uh, placement visits or different points of contact but sometimes people say oh, i couldn't call the university it felt a bit big to call the university 
university but um, they're the same people they're the same individuals and just because you're not physically at the university or having those kind of timetable sessions they are absolutely there to to continue to support you and would want to really be doing that proactively rather than reactively um, so that we can you know be be there to support you so I think that's just keeping them to hand making sure you know how to contact people at university as well as within your placement team and your peers is really important yeah, some good tips there. So there's some obviously different placement delivery models such as research placements, project based placements, also we've got role emerging non traditional placements and things like that. Do you feel that so I'd go into Elizabeth so being um, innovative as we talk about obviously innovative placements so being innovative within a, a statutory service or a, an existing service as opposed to you know creating something brand new I think we had a, one of the placement webinars, um, you know paddle boarding so you know how would you do it in your service? You know because it, it's not just about obviously a brand new service it's also how would you maybe implement some of those is there any ideas that you might have that how you might include students in, in different placement delivery models but within an existing service does that make sense yeah no I think I think it does you can tell me if I answer correctly Clima so the <laughs> I suppose we we've been fortunate enough to be part of a student-led clinical learning environment as a as a a sort of collaboration between nursing and therapies um, within our, our hospital trust. And so it's been quite a big project in that sense, you know, lots of planning and, and implementing to get to where we are now. But that I think that's a real different way of um, delivering practice placements within an existing service. So it's a big acute hospital and so the wards are, are always going to be there, you know, and, and the patients and, and everything else. But actually having um, a mix of a multidisciplinary team of students additional to the existing team on the ward um, has been a very different way of us approaching this. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a much that's a much bigger it's a, that's a much bigger thing than I, than I can talk about in a, in a snapshot now. And I did talk about it on one of the other webinars, but. Um, that could even be done on a much smaller scale because the, the principles rest on the ideas of coaching models. Um, the principles rest on the idea of giving the, the, the students the, the safety and the, um, the confidence, if you like, to start to lead on things and, and I think people sometimes find that hard to get their heads around they sort of think you know how can you ask a student to lead on something when <laughs> they don't know what they're doing yet but I think it's about it, it's about sort of um giving a really thorough introduction to an area in order then it's not on day one you know you just open the door to the ward and, and hope for the best you know it's about giving that introduction and using the, the the coaching model to help students understand what it is that maybe they didn't know they didn't know so that they can start asking the right questions they can find things out for themselves they can um you know just start to meet the patients even before you know they they kind of know what it is that they can then start to do within that ot role or or any of the other um ahp roles actually so that's been a really lovely experience um for us and i guess the other type of model that i'd mention is is a leadership type placement again you know we, we've sort of got lots of band aids in services and and they can have students too and i think that it's something that often we don't we don't think about um in quite the same way I think it sits a lot especially in some of our other professions it sits squarely with the band sixes and, and and people don't want to kind of move out of that but I think gradually we're doing that more and more you know we've talked about our support workforce we've talked about our newly qualified as well as our sixes as well as our sevens as well as our band eights and I think that leadership placements as a, a different sort of placement um, we've been able to run them as a hybrid model so that we've got students who are in a big group of, of usually 10 and they can um, um, work on different projects as a whole group as well as on individual work and we do a lot of facilitation on teams but then we we make it hybrid by having them come in to spend nine days across a five or six week placement with some of our, our more senior leaders within the organization to work on a service improvement project um, so they get that on-site experience as well. And I think that's been 
really lovely and transformative for people, um, for us as well as educators. And I think that's something we could all look to getting involved with. Yes, good ideas there. So, um, Carolyn? Sorry. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of different ways of doing it. And I think, you know, <laughs> this is just completely given a whole list of different ways of, of you know, within one organisation, which is the, the brilliance of this. And for me, it's about matching you, your skills, the roles that you're working within, um, the opportunities that present students. So, you know, you don't need to have one model and we've always done it like this. There's lots of ways of, of changing things. So um, we've got some students starting with us at RCOT in, in January. One's going to be looking, or two of them together, will be looking at a particular project, which gives us a chance for a leadership placement. But the other one we're looking at um, will be a hybrid placement based in practice and then developing resources relevant to that client group. So it'd be working with children and focusing on hand, handwriting and then looking at the resources and leaving a legacy. And I think I'm really excited by, by those two because that will give us um, some real different ways of approaching um, practice-based learning and I'm trying to be really good and implement our um, principles and think about how we're using those throughout writing principles you have to follow them and um, so we're making sure that we're kind of thinking about how we do that and can get that feedback for me one of the key bits is having good feedback which we haven't really talked about and I don't mean good feedback as in everyone saying it's wonderful but really clear feedback mechanisms that are all feeding into each other and are that at the right point so, you know, we know that our students are being assessed. So giving them the feedback form just before their final assessment might not be the right place to do that. Um, you know, we need to think about when we're giving that feedback to then think about how has this worked for you? What can we learn in terms of these supervision models that we're following? Um, how can we, um, you know, link into the feedback that the universities are getting and all, you know, really then give the right offer that works that benefits our clients ultimately. And that's what we're wanting to do is produce um, really good quality placements that support our learners to have the best introduction to the profession they can have to go on to be brilliant and support our clients to have the best experience of occupational therapy and um, it really works for them so I think that's where we're coming from there is a whole range of placement models and um, there's loads of research about it I think for me it, it can feel really overwhelming to think what can I do there's almost too much choice which is a really happy situation um, so for me, it would be about chatting to your placement leads within your organisation, chatting to your um, clinical expansion facilitators or whatever kind of roles you've got and chatting to your university course teams about the different types of placements. The role emerging, uh, sorry, uh, long arm supervision is a great opportunity if you feel that it's quite tricky for you within your direct organisation or direct area that you're working within to support students. And there is a huge number of role emerging placements that will link to your area of practice. And I know that there are more placements ready to roll than there are long arm supervisors at the moment. Um, so anything we can do to support people in feeling confident in being a long arm supervisor, um, you know, we absolutely will do because that will really help us to pop OT into areas that are new and evolving um, and exciting areas for practice. But also it's a really good skill set in terms of being a long arm supervisor um, and a great, a great opportunity. Nice to try something new. Yeah, thanks for that. And um, so, Terry, I know you had obviously Rosina and Derek on placement as well. So for a non-traditional non placement or role emerging placement. Yeah, it's difficult to know what to call it, really, because for me, it's 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 my practice. It's what I do every day. So so I kind of don't think of it as role emerging, but I recognise that it's maybe non-traditional and not necessarily what what students are expecting to do. Um, I, I think this is part of a. So there's sort of two streams for me for placements. One that we've talked about already is actually if you're a practicing occupational therapist, then students can learn from you. So there, there are things in your practice they can learn. But the other strip, strand for me is anywhere that, that, that you think, gosh, I wish there was an occupational therapist in there, or wouldn't it be great if there was occupational therapy within that service, that, that's also um, sort of rife for placement development. So there's sort of almost these two streams. And you know, I, I know that we all think occupational therapists could take over the world because we're, we're all brilliant, but there, there is actually a genuine element of lots of places where you can see that occupational therapy would be really great in there and students could learn lots in there. So this is what we need, you know, we need to develop. And I think things often start off feeling like they're role emerging and then they quite quickly become not role emerging anymore. The role has been established, but now it's a non-traditional placement on the basis that perhaps it's got a long arm educator. Um, 
And a colleague a few years ago said to me, you know, I'd really like to get to a point where we don't talk about what kind of placement it is, it's just a placement. And at the time, that felt like it was a long way off, but I think it's feeling closer, actually. You know, they're all just placements. Students are meeting the same learning outcomes, no matter the setting. Um, so it's just about curating all these opportunities that we can see into placements that are obviously, you know, quality checked and have got the appropriate support and, and supervision and the appropriate channels for students to come back and tell us if they don't work so well as well. Um, but yeah, the, I think the world's your oyster, there's so much out there. So let's go to Rosina as well. So you had a role emerging placement. So what were your fears about doing a role emerging placement and how did you try to manage this? So I think I'll talk more specifically about my own um, experience of doing the placement at Worcester. Um, so doing a student lecturer placement, my fears were obviously public speaking. Um, that was one of my biggest fears. Um, and kind of standing up in, at the front of a lecture um, and talking to students and teaching them. Um, I wasn't confident in speaking to the students as a big group. And also I wasn't confident in my own knowledge of um, what I'd learned at my own university to be able to teach other people um, because I didn't have that confidence and I was also not great at explaining things. Um, but I managed that by talking to Terry beforehand um, via email, um, asking her what did this role in, um, entail? Um, and then we had a meeting, a pre placement meeting and she kind of went through um, what I'd be doing and it wasn't necessarily that I'd be leading a lecture on my first day or my first week um, and that kind of settled my nerves definitely um, I was told that we'd take it at my own pace um, and by the end the only time I led a full lecture was on my um, last week which was definitely at my own pace and it was um, really great for me to be able to see actually I do know things um, but I just wasn't confident at the beginning to teach that to students but I did know the things and I was able to when going around facilitating conversations with students I did start to realize that actually I do know this and I can help the students with that um, so that um, this placement really helped me with that um, and it was just simply having a quick chat with Terry or my own educator um, about what my fears were and how we can manage this together. Um, so yeah, simple communication. Yeah. And Derek? Um, I think just like Rosina, I think I'm walking into the place and obviously <laughs> not having a placement anywhere close to this. I think I was quite nervous as well about being in front of a group of students and just um, teaching essentially. Because me personally, I can talk a lot. I can talk for hours. <laughs> like I can just not shut up sometimes. And I don't think that was my concern. I think my concern was the fact that like Rosina was saying is being able to talk to a huge group and say something that's gonna be beneficial to them. I I um I think I think I'm I made a joke a couple of times, like with friends or family. I was like, oh, how am I going to go in there and teach if I don't know? But in the back of my head, I was like, actually, I'm not sure if I <laughs> do know to go in and teach. But then while the placement was going, while I was talking to Terry and coming back to the whole having another student, talking to Rosina, just sometimes we just sat down. I was like, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> and we literally sat down there and just spoke to each other. I was like, what are we doing? How, how are we going to do this? How can we make this placement not only beneficial to us, but also to the students, because at the end of the day, we're working for the students with the students. So I think having, again, like Rosina was saying, having that communication in the different areas of support that you can find is, um, yeah, is one of the, best, personally, one of the best ways to manage the concerns that I was having. My other concern was, because it's a um, non-traditional placement, I found it difficult to apply my OT knowledge, occupational therapy knowledge, to this placement. So when we're considering models, models of practice, frames of reference, and um, clinical reasoning, in my head, I was like, this, this is not easy. I, I don't see how I can fit this into this. And when I had those concerns, during supervision, I just told Terry, I'll be like, I'm not sure <laughs> if I understand how OT fits into this. But as the weeks, as the days went on, as the weeks went on, talking to Terry, talking to other educators, to other students, to, um, I mean, by students, I mean other third-year students from Worcester, and just bouncing ideas or having those conversations, I was able to slowly build up my confidence in how OT is applied to this setting. So I think, yeah, my overall message is um, communication. I think 
any concern that I had, I would communicate with my educators, I would communicate with peers and settle my nerves a little bit. And also, um, although I didn't do it that much, but I think research also helps a lot because again, it's a non-traditional placement. It's not done often. Sometimes it can be hard to see how OT fits into it, but then OT can almost fit anywhere pretty much. <laughs> so um, so yeah, looking having that research and looking up how does occupational therapy, how can occupational therapy work as a student lecturer? Sometimes it can be a lot harder to find, but sometimes those quick searches and seeing different forms of different people's opinions or similar experience, maybe not the exact same thing, but those similar um, experiences does help because um, you're like, okay, they did this, this group did this. What can I learn from each group and apply it to my own learning for this setting that I am doing for my placement? So yeah, mm -hmm. so communicating and researching and hearing other people's opinion. I think that's the way I was able to <laughs> overcome my concerns. <laughs> I suppose it built your confidence as well, having a student yeah, lecturer definitely. as well, and at a, a different university than what you go to as well. So I think that was a, a lot a good experience for you as well. So just another question, really. So what were you hoping to achieve from being on a role emerging placement? So I'll go to Rosina. Um, so once I kind of got over the initial nerves, I kind of tried to see where the opportunities were for me. Um, so I was trying to like achieve um a more of a leadership role because in my previous placements they were traditional so there was not much of a, a leadership for me um and leadership doesn't come naturally to me so I was trying to go out of my comfort zone um and gain more leadership skills because I know in your on your CV and in job interviews that's like a really big ask and um, it's like a very good skill to have those leadership skills um, so I wanted to kind of find where the opportunities were for me to have those leadership skills, lead, lead on any group projects, um, lead any facilitations with students. Um, and I wanted to build the confidence um, in speaking to large groups of people. Um, so delivering, um, even if it was tiny slots within lectures and seminars, delivering those and building up to um, full seminars or full lectures. Um, and I think I also just wanted to learn from the other students as well, because um, so there was two other students who were third years. Um, we did a group project with them and I could bounce ideas with, off them and we learned a lot from them. Um, but also the first year students who I was teaching um I learned a lot from them which it was really interesting to see sometimes I was coming from a different point of view and they said well actually no I think like this or I think that this is this and it was really interesting to see um how differing our opinions and our ideas were but they were all still correct and we could all learn from each other and I really enjoyed um having those discussions with the students and learning from them as well okay thanks for that. and uh, Derek <coughs> um I think I had a couple of goals set for myself. I'm trying to keep it short. I think first I wanted to, um, <clears throat> how to put it? <laughs> I wanted to really help the students. I really wanted to bring my knowledge and what I know and give all that information to them and make them make the most of it. Because I think, because I try, I try to relate to them as a first year student in your first couple of weeks, this is completely new environment. This is a university setting. I'm working with people that I've never met before. I'm doing a course I'm probably not very familiar with in terms of experience. And I think I was like, I want to help them with my experience. I think I found it very helpful, the fact that because this was a non-traditional placement and I was working with students who were also doing the course, it really gave me the opportunity to, to be able to develop that rapport building that you obviously can apply to your other clinical settings. So I was able to sit there with the students and be like, okay, where are your concerns? I had the exact same thing. This is why I overcame it. <laughs> so it was just able to give what I know to them and hopefully help them feel a lot more confident, feel a lot more comfortable, or, or just overall knowing that someone else has been through the same thing. During one of my, um, one of my weeks, I think it was week nine. Anyways, I set up um, some dropping sessions, some anatomy and physiology um, sessions. And I was quite surprised that a couple of them came. So um, yeah, quite a bit of them came. <laughs> and um, they all spoke about how helpful they found it that, um, that I was helping them because I was also a student. And I think that was one of my concerns that because I'm a student, they might not take me seriously. 
So one of my goals was to be able to overcome that and being able to throw my knowledge at them and for them to use that knowledge. And they overall, I think I did a great job because they all said <laughs> that they really enjoyed it. They really liked it and they really have learned a lot, not only from straight up giving them the um, information, but also being able to relate to them and giving them my experience. So yeah, I think, yeah, that was one of my main goals, being able to make the most of what I know. Because at first, like I said, I wasn't sure if I knew enough to teach them. But then I got to a point where I was like, you know, I do know this. I do know what I'm doing. Now that I know this and I have all this information, let me just chuck it at them and help them help them learn as well. Um, my other thing was, like I was mentioning earlier, I found it quite difficult to apply occupational therapy my, um, theory into the setting. So I think my goal overall was, even though I knew how it worked, was to constantly keep it in my head. Because when I say occupational therapist can work anywhere, that's something that's always in the back of my head, but I've never actually broken it down and be like, how can occupational therapists work here in detail rather than just saying, oh yeah, they work here. So we had a couple of projects, me and Rosina and other students in which we made like a OT process presentation and we tried to apply it to this setting. So, um, so yeah, so we used that. And I think that did help me a lot to put on, to make everything fit. But at the same time, I didn't want it. I really didn't want it to be something that I do for the sake of doing for just for like an assignment. So I try to have that and keep it in my head constantly and go into this placement. And whenever I'm teaching, whenever I'm working with the students, keep that in my head, think about, okay, what am I doing from an occupational therapist point of view? And think about how I can apply this to other settings. Because right. personally, I really want to go into, um, <clears throat> into like a clinical setting after I qualify, going to maybe working in hospitals and so I was trying to make the most of this placement to see what I can learn from this because there was definitely a lot to learn. <laughs> there was a lot to learn from a placement like this. I think I, I was constantly thinking, okay, what am I doing now? And how can I use this and translate it over to now a clinical setting? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I really, I, I think that was one of my main goals once I got my head around how the placement worked and what I would be doing. I really wanted to make the most of what I'm doing, but also how I can use that knowledge to transfer it over to um other practices so yeah <laughs> they're really utilizing transferable skills as well and making yeah. sure you know what you're yeah what you're doing in that setting which is a good idea so i'm glad glad you had a good time on your placement as well so i had your good feedback so um just another question so it says i work part-time can i still have a student so i'll go to carolyn first uh, yes um, yeah, is the answer. So, <laughs> um, I think this goes back to some of the conversations we've had about working as part of a team, um, as having more than one student at a time. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is we need to know that the students have a point of contact to go to throughout. They're able to be kept safe and to keep their clients that they're working with safe. So, um, you know, it's about thinking about who who else in the team um, is is part of that role. And I, I don't think there's probably much more to add, I'm sure, um, you know, Liz and Terry might have some, something to add, but the answer is yes. Um, and I think that, you know, the other bit is people work different shift patterns now. So you might do a 12 hour shift and do three days on or, or what have you. Absolutely, that can work. And that might be that students join that shift pattern. And, you know, again, that's about chatting to the uni and getting the placement set up properly. Um, and, you know, that clear communication or that students can work different hours amongst that. But again, having that point of contact, somebody they can go to as a reference um, and making sure they're, they're keeping safe ultimately. And um, Liz, do you have anything to add? Not really. No, I mean, either, take a part time student or take a full time student and share them. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> That team support as well, going back to the, the principles as well. Uh, Derek? Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring it from like a student point of view, because in my first placement, obviously, I, um, I wasn't the one doing part time. My educator wasn't the one doing part time, but I did experience that one of the other occupational therapists was part time and they did have a student. Um, and I think, um, although it does sound challenging, from the way I've spoke to the student and the way I've seen, um, seen how they interact, I think it was a really good opportunity for that student to also develop that, excuse me, that independence, because <clears throat> um, maybe one or two days the educator may not have come in or couldn't do the exact hours that um, was expected. Or, so that student was able to 
be proactive and be like, okay, my educator is not here. What can I do considering the fact that I'm a student? And then I, found, I saw that a lot of times they just went to another occupational therapist and be like, how can I help? What can I do? So, um, so yeah, although obviously I can't speak from an educator's point of view, but although it can seem daunting that um, even if they're working part-time and the student um, might not learn as much, I don't feel like that's the case. I feel like the student, the student can learn a lot from other occupational therapists or other members of the team. And I think that comes back again to that whole working as part of, part as, of an MDT, that teamwork and skills that they may develop. And it does give an opportunity for them to learn a lot more, essentially. <laughs> yeah. It's about sharing, isn't it? Sharing the responsibility and everyone getting involved with the student ed student education as well. So even if the, edu the named educator is not there, everyone else still is. The, the service is still functioning. There's still obviously adequate people there to provide support as well. So uh, Terry, anything to add? No? No, not really. I think you've said it all. Yeah. <laughs> There's another question. How do I set up a new placement? I'll go to Carolyn first. Um, well, um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm just doing this for our students that are coming to our CAT. You call your local HEI and say, I'd really like to set up a placement. So all of your, everyone's organisations are different. If you work in a small organisation or for charity or, um, you know, independent practice, then absolutely go straight to your local HEI. And it doesn't necessarily need to be your local HEI as well. There's you know, lots of different placement models around. And I know some organizations operate nationally, uh, particularly charities. So there's lots of different things, but I kind of go local because then you might be able to meet for a coffee. Um, have a chat with them if you're in a big organization you'll have an infrastructure where people like Liz have roles and you would go to them and they'll they'll be your point of contact but um you know certainly your HTI can then put you in contact if you're not too sure um for me it's about thinking you know just having that initial conversation there's opportunities for your practice educator training and um, to have that chance to think about what what your placement's going to look like how you can be involved um, I would have a look at our placement principles, which we've developed with CSP, and they will talk you through some of the key bits around placements. They don't tell you how to set up a placement. Uh, they're about key principles, but things that you might want to just take time to consider um, individually as a group and involve your students in that as well in terms of how you can set up that placement. Um, and it will it will evolve. It, it's not as complicated as you think it might be. Um, it, it is really straightforward um, and you know deliberately so because we want you to be able to do that um, and to have have that placement set up but I would definitely talk to your version of Liz within your team or your version of um, Terry or Kalima within your university. So, so if someone works in the third sector maybe like a, a small charity or non-social um, enterprise it's just contact the local HI the local university or a university yeah. So yeah, think, or come to me and I will put you in touch. And I'm off, I'm often doing that, particularly where there's a big charity that's saying, you know, we work nationally, we we work virtually, where do we go? What's our starting point? Then when we can have chats there about how you know how best to support people. And you don't have to work with one university, you can work with lots of different universities um, and do all sorts of different things. There's no one model, but I would go to one starting point to have the conversation to set your, your kind of train of thought going, really. Okay. And um, just another question. So um, some undergrads or some, sorry, some apprentice students. So the students that are working, obviously working as well as um, studying to become an OT pre-registration. Some of them have said maybe when they go on placement, they're treat, still treated as OT, um, OT assistants and not students. So what do you say to that, Carolyn? Um, I think this is about um, having clear conversations about the um, the purpose of that placement and the role so you know as we've started we've kind of gone full circle on the conversation really every student brings their own skills and experiences so an apprentice is going to bring some real expertise of a particular area of practice that they um, often um, apprentices have been working in an area for quite a while as support worker roles but not necessarily you know we're, we're now at a point where we're getting people coming straight from a levels into apprenticeships and don't have that experience they they might from a placement point of view seem um you know more along the lines of what you might expect from a student who hasn't got previous OT experience so um you know we've 
I think it's about being really clear on what are the learning outcomes of that placement and what's the student bringing for you, what's new. So an apprentice is actually going to be potentially even more nervous than um, an, an OT student because they've got their employer um, as a, a pressure there. Their job is on the basis of this. So, you know, there's, there's a huge amount there in terms of making sure that everyone's really clear on the expectations. An apprentice works at exactly the same standards. Um, they might you know, be more used to a hospital environment, for example, but they might not. It might be the first time they've stepped into a particular environment. So it's about understanding that person, being really clear about the strengths they're bringing, the areas that they haven't clue about, never had an opportunity to practice and the areas that they want to work on. And that's just taking the same approach as every other student. But where people have strengths, provide the opportunities to really excel as the same way that you would do for any student. And uh, Liz, do you have anything to add? I'm going to say the word student centred again, and that's yeah. that's all. <laughs> yeah, still students, and they need to meet the learning outcomes for the placement, regardless. Yeah. So, Terry, I'm not sure if you have uh, apprentices at your HEI. We don't, but I just just wanted to add, you know, from the from the apprentices' point of view, actually thinking about how they introduce themselves and how they position themselves in that placement is really important. So, actually going in and saying, "I'm a student occupational therapist, um, and I'm on the apprenticeship program," for example, rather than um, you know, necessarily identifying as a member of the team from the outset, um, it's really difficult. I think when you've got a familiar environment and you're perhaps you know having to shift roles within a, a very sort of familiar setup but I think there is a, you know a level of um sort of change of language and change of perception that actually the apprentices themselves can do to help that that process through as well but I completely agree we should be student-centered it's all about the learning outcomes it's all about focusing on what you need to do for that placement Okay, thanks very much for that. Just going back to long arm supervision, I know, um, Carolyn, you did mention it earlier on. So there's different models of long arm supervision, sometimes in some non-traditional role emerging placements, sometimes universities also provide long arm supervision. Is that Has that been the case? Do you know of any cases like that? Or can I also go to Terry after that? Yeah, well, um, yeah, Terry's an example of somebody working at a university and being an educator, not necessarily a long arm in this, in this example. I think um, when role emerging placements initially set up and, and often they were role emerging placements that had long arm supervisors and this is where our language is evolving and we're all having lots of conversations like Terry's brought up there about this language isn't quite right at the moment but we don't quite know where it's we're in a transition and we're not quite sure where we're going to come out the other end in terms of the language but essentially placements are much more clearly across all four pillars of practice and I think that's you know that's the, the clear bit some are in established areas some are in less established areas for OT which hopefully do become established and um, when when those placements set up um, and particularly over Covid there was a huge drive by everybody but the university course tutors were often the people who just wanted to get those placements up and running and did provide long-arm supervision and um, the goal is always that we have placements that are sustainable um, and that's not always possible to do for the volume of placements but you do have a lot of people in a huge range of roles including university course tutors who are offering long arm supervision um, but that doesn't need to be done by a uni tutor it needs to be done by anybody who has the skills and the opportunities there to support those roles um, so yeah I think you can get university tutors who are doing it but we would want everybody to have that opportunity available to them I know in Scotland there's lots of opportunities and placements that are waiting for long arm supervisors um, you know Claire Headley when she's come and talked before would, would talk about that and, and trying to find people and you know think about the roles that you're in or how you might be able to take on that role yourself and um, Terry yeah, our experience is actually from, the, from the, the flip side of that. So we traditionally haven't actually used our university educators as our long-arm educators. We've sourced from practice and we've got now a really lovely established pool of educators in practice. Um, it suits all sorts of people. Anybody can do it, but there are particular people that it suits. And I think... Um, you, perhaps people who have maybe reduced their hours, but they would quite like to be doing something else. Maybe they're, you know, they're on a part time contract, but they're feeling like they've got a bit more time um, in their week than than they thought they would have. Um, have been some really successful long arm educators because they can just, you know, shimmy their work around accordingly. Um, equally, you know, people who perhaps don't have any clinical contact in their roles anymore, but really want to have student contact um, and haven't yet got to the point of maybe being able to set up what a placement might look like in their particular role. They make fantastic long, long arm educators um, as well. Um, I'm just trying to think of some of the some of the pull we've got. What tends to happen is that people get people start to really quite like this role as a long arm educator um, because 
from an education perspective, you get to do all the really lovely stuff with the students and you don't actually have to plan what they're going to do on a day to day basis because they do that themselves in the setting. So it kind of is, is quite a nice role, actually. Um, sometimes we found that if there's a particular um, organisation that are offering us a placement, then there might be an occupational therapist working in that speciality. So certainly when some of the um, third sector or charities will offer a placement, um, for example, it, you know, working with people with dementia in a, in a day service, then we might have some dementia specialist OTs who are really keen to get involved because it helps them also to see perhaps what's happening a little bit more in that in that service that they might refer people on to and then never see. So there are loads of really good opportunities for, for long-arm educators. And what we're finding is that the more they do it, the more they enjoy it, the more they will move away from their own perhaps clinical specialty and then stretch themselves as educators. Um, and that can be a really nice thing as well. So maybe starting out with somewhere you're really comfortable and then saying, actually, no, maybe my speciality now is being a long-arm educator. And maybe it doesn't really matter what the um, what the workplace is and the placement environment is like. Maybe I can do it for any student. And so beginning to move that way as well. Um, we do try and get them in contact with each other, although it's a bit more of a challenge, um, but that can also be helpful. So they've got somebody to, to bounce ideas off. And of course, just recognising that the university are always there to support. So if they are struggling for whatever reason, there will be somebody that can, can help you with that from, from our end as well. Okay. Liz, have you had any experience working with long arm educators or supervisors sorry do you know i haven't actually um and it is something that i've thought about it, it's hard to to squeeze it in i think for me in my, in my kind of full-time role to, to 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 think or how could this work I, I suppose the only minor version of this i can think about is when we've had um we had a new a, a new sort of placement set up if you like and I wasn't working there clinically, but I offered to support the clinical team by providing group supervision to the students. So I, I guess that was not dissimilar um, in, in the sense that I wasn't directly involved kind of day to day, uh, but it gave everybody uh, some opportunity, I suppose, both me, the, the group of students and then the clinical team it kind of had that space and and the feedback was was really positive you know that it that it really benefited to have somebody who actually wasn't connected day to day to be able to help the students think about what they were doing and and why um so I suppose I've done a, a minor version of that but not I've not experienced it actually it's something I I'm lacking in the in my in my portfolio there so <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming to an end now. Obviously, we can talk for a long time. So tried to just de demystify just some questions that people have asked throughout the other webinars, really, and just to bring people that are enthusiastic about placements and also just to get, you know, different different ideas as well. So I'm hoping that you found this useful. So um, we'll just go back to the slides now and we'll just come to an end. So. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks. So, yes, yeah, so reflection and feedback. So there is a one second. So there's a five minute reflection tool on the RCAT website and the links also in the chat as well. And you can just use that to reflect on the conversation today and also use it for your CPD as well. And also feedback, there's a QR code or there's a link in the chat. And if you just like to give us feedback about maybe the, the placement series or anything else that you find that um, was useful for you as well. So we're just open to hear your feedback. So the, the link's in the chat as well. Okay, and this is the practice-based learning. The links will be in the uh, chat, the principles that we were talking about throughout the session. And you'll find them on this website. There's also some other reflective scenarios and some information about placement areas as well, placement cafe and, and the placement program as well. So you can just take a look on the website. There's some resources on there. So just thank you for your time and your thoughts, really. So if you'd just like to tweet us at hashtag um, RCATPBL, just any comments, and also there's the link to the website that I was just talking about, and these, this the webinar series will eventually be on this website as well for resources that you can you can obviously refer back to. So we hope you enjoyed the series. So this is the end of our, this is a sixth part, so it's the end of our um, six webinar series anyway. So I'd just like to thank you all for your time and for listening, and thanks to the panel demystifying some of the questions that we've had and um, I hope you find this this service useful this uh, sorry the webinar service as uh, the webinar useful thanks very much okay, bye <laughs>